to the Sanchez Adobe. My name is Chris Vargas and I'm a docent and president of the Montebello Historical Society. And this is the Juan Matthias Sanchez Adobe and it's the oldest structure uh, in Montebello. It was built in 1845, uh, so that makes it 170 plus years old. This is what we uh, call our California timeline. Uh, it gives a, a timeline of uh, Montebello and all the different uh, historical uh, parts, components that it went through. Donia Lobo, as we call her, was the first resident. Uh, she received a uh, land grant from the then governor, uh, Governor uh, Micha Torrena, when California, and then California was called Alta California, Upper California at the time, when it was a Mexican territory from 1821 until uh, 1848. And there were a few conditions when she received the grant. Uh, one was to build an adobe, and she had three sons, and they helped her build the adobe, raise livestock. Uh, the livestock of choice at the time was cattle, so she raised cattle, and then to raise some sort of uh, uh, crop, uh, cotton, uh, have a vineyard, uh, a garden of some sort. Uh, we like to uh, focus uh, on uh, one of the battles that took place during the Mexican-American War of 1846, 1847, 1848, uh, the Battle of Rio San Gabriel, uh, which was fought uh, in the general area of uh, Bluff in Washington uh, when you cross the bridge. Uh, this was the uh, really the capitulation of California, uh, which led to the uh, signing of the Treaty of Cahuenga. Uh, and the Californios, as they were called, uh, Mexicans here, uh, basically uh, gave up the fight uh, and it, the Americans eventually took over uh, California. Juan Matthias, the namesake of the adobe, was originally from New Mexico. Uh, we think, uh, based on uh, records, uh, because he had a cattle patent, uh, the cattle patent here in 1846, so we know he was generally here, but he didn't come to live in the adobe until about 1852 uh, when he received, when it was deeded to him for one dollar. Uh, the original owner, uh, Donia Lobo, ended up losing the property uh, and uh, the property was deeded to Mr. Sanchez. And we have uh, a number of photographs of the Sanchez family, uh, here being a picture of Mr. Sanchez and his first and second wife. Uh, his uh, first wife was Archuleta. Uh, and from that marriage, uh, they had four boys and one daughter. Uh, and here are some photographs, and here's a photograph of the daughter, uh, Maria de la Luz, who was born in 1861 and lived, in through, lived through the mid-1940s. She's actually buried at Calvary Cemetery uh, in East Los Angeles, just right off Whittier Boulevard. Come out through the back door, you'll notice that the adobe was built on a bluff. And it was built on a bluff because in the 1840s uh, there was a wild river out here, the San Gabriel River. Uh, and so uh, being built on a bluff, uh, it prevented it from being flooded. Uh, and if you look here at this uh, porch here, this was actually the front porch uh, during the 1840s, early 1850s, uh, facing, facing the river. Now, as you can see, we have homes and we had these eucalyptus trees. The eucalyptus trees aren't native. Uh, there would have been actually no homes here, uh, just groves of uh, oaks, oak trees. Oak tree was the primary tree here in Montebello. Our 20th century room, uh, we have a number of exhibits and we're very proud of uh, this particular exhibit which uh, commemorates our veterans here in Montebello. Uh, here, uh, it's primarily the Vietnam area and we have uh, Reggie Rodriguez, who was killed in action uh, in the late 1960s, and uh, for those of you from Montebello, you know that there's a park named after Reggie. Uh, Reggie comes from a family of four boys uh, who were all in the Marines uh, during the Vietnam era. We have an exhibit here of Grant Ray, uh, and I, for the years that I've lived here since 99, was not aware that Grant Ray Park was named after uh, a World War II pilot, Grant Ray, who was shot over uh, shot down over the Pacific. This this is a reflection of Montebello uh, and its commerce, uh, Simon's Brick Company. Uh, it was one of the leading producers of brick uh, in the nation and California. Uh, it was truly a company town. People lived there uh, and uh, they had their own company store. Uh, 
the employees were primarily uh, from Mexico, um, and uh, we've had this set up for a couple of years, Simon's Brickyard. Occasionally, we do have an exhibit uh, and uh, a speaker come down and, and, and discuss and talk about uh, Simon's Brickyard. But let me introduce you to John Reed. John Reed is our curator, uh, and he is the director of the museum. He's primarily responsible for what you've seen and what we've uh, gone through uh, during this little session here. Now, we like to lighten things up. We don't always like to uh, just focus on uh, you know, the history of, 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 of California in the 19th century. And John, why don't you come here uh, sure. and explain uh, your G.I. Joe exhibit. Hi, I'm John Reed. I'm the curator and exhibit preparer for the Sanchez Adobe, and this is one of our new exhibits. Uh, as a kid growing up in the 60s, G.I. Joe was uh, on the Christmas list every December, and every kid that uh, was uh, growing up in the 60s probably watched Combat, McHale's Navy, uh, saw the war movies, and uh, we became really fascinated with the military. And G.I. Joe was just a wonderful little toy, and, and uh, he had so many different accessories, and you can make him a you can make him a deep sea diver, an astronaut. They even had a Jeep here. And I remember as a little kid being able to sit on that and ride it down the driveway. And it was just a wonderful toy. And uh, it's just a shame that uh, they had to change him at the end of the 60s because of all the war protests. But he uh, came back in the 90s. They uh, reissued G.I. Joe, and he's still going strong after all these years. OK, here we have some uh, small memorabilia from the 20th century. Unfortunately, uh, the Montebello Historical Society, about maybe 10 years ago, some curator decided to throw out everything that was 1920s and newer. And to our dismay, any, everything was missing from upstairs. So we have to hit eBay, I hit swap meets, and secondhand stores looking for anything from Montebello. I've been able to find a few objects, and some items have been donated. Uh, we had police patches donated from policemen, a ranger patch donated from the rangers. And uh, I was able to go up on eBay and find some of the baseball cards and pictures of former Montebello athletes that became professionals. I would still love to find Montebello uh, letterman jackets, football jerseys, baseball jerseys, um, anything from Montebello that says Montebello on it. And to my surprise, there's not much out there. A lot of, a lot of bottle caps, but no uh, other memorabilia. This is a, a kind of a model of the SS Montebello. The uh, Mont city of Montebello had a ship named after the city. Uh, it was an oil tanker built in the early 20s, launched in San Pedro. And during World War II, right after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, December 7th, December 24th, uh, the Montebello was fully loaded, traveling north up the coast. And she was attacked and sunk by a Japanese submarine. All of the crew did uh, survive the sinking and got into the lifeboats. And uh, the, the, first the first torpedo actually missed the ship. The second one hit right at the bow, so they were very lucky that it didn't hit the middle because it would have blown up all the oil. So the ship did sink, and the crew survived. Years later, in the 80s, they discovered the wreck to be about 900 feet below surface, and they thought it was an environmental disaster, thinking that the crude oil was still in the ship. And after the government spent a couple million dollars sending submersibles down, they discovered that the ship was totally empty. All the oil had seeped away from the ship from all those years underwater. A lot of people have driven on the five freeway. Myself, as a young child, when my dad used to take us to the Rams football games, we would always pass these, this building, and it was the, at the time the Uniroyal rubber plant. And I always asked my father, why does it look like an Egyptian building or something from the Bible? And he wouldn't, couldn't tell me. But as a curator here, I discovered that that building was built back in the 1920s, 1929 actually opened during the, 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 the stock market crash. The owner named it Samson Tires, and it was named after the strongest man in the Bible. And we found out the architecture uh, styling of the outside of the building was an Assyrian king's architect that they, they copied. So he was really into the Bible, and that's why the building looks like it did. And what happened, the plant was successful, but later was bought out by a bigger company, U.S. Rubber. And U.S. Rubber took over the plant. During uh, World War II, they built uh, self the air, uh, airplane uh, bomber tanks and also rubber pieces for uh, the uh, M5 uh, Stewart tank to help with the war effort. Then after uh, World War II, later in the 60s, it became Uniroyal Tire. And then after that, in the uh, late 80s, they closed the plant down and people were upset because they heard they were going to tear it down. But they decided to save it and they, they, now it's known as the Citadel. 
which is the outlet center. So everybody drives past that on the flyer. That's originally the old Samson Tire Plant of Montebello.